mental health, particularly the aspect of suicide, is among us, around us. Perhaps someone listening right now has thought about it or even attempted it. It often leaves people feeling hopeless without any way to get out of a very dark hole. We need to destigmatize this conversation to provide guidance, support, and ways to engage in the conversation toward healing and wholeness in business, in family, in life. I'm Dr. Nate Sala, and this is A Call to Leadership. Dr. Keith, so good to have you on the program. Thanks for being here, man. Hey, Dr. Nate, thank you so much for inviting me. I do appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, we got connected because I was so interested in some of your content, especially around an area we haven't talked about uh, very often, if much at all on the show, is this area that deals with mental health around suicide. Even the term itself is like, oh my goodness, do we really need to talk about that? And the answer is yes. In fact, I'm going to read a few statistics as we uh, as we get our conversation going. And uh, this is from the uh, the suicide uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Suicide is the eleventh leading cause of death in the United States, according to this group. In 2021, there were uh, 48,183 Americans who died by suicide, um, and an estimate of this is this is boggling 1.7 million suicide attempts. Uh, and that's recorded, probably. Yeah, and that's just recorded. No, yeah, those are known. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's staggering. Uh, uh, as you already probably know, the rate of suicide is highest in middle-aged white men. Me? <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> right. <laughs> I uh, I qualify maybe for like off-white man. Twenty twenty one men died by suicide three point nine x more than women. Uh, on average, there are one hundred and thirty two suicides per day. Staggering numbers. Yeah. Staggering numbers. What brought you into this this conversation? The evolution of of thought, and I'm glad you asked the question. But before I answer, can I can we go back to some of those numbers? Because Please. you know we talk about uh, you know suicide first died by suicide. So we used to use the phrase committed uh, committed suicide, and we've kind of moved away from that in terms of the community died by suicide is either the correct or the politically correct or the appropriate way of, uh, of talking about it uh, because it's not like a sickness or a disease. It's just an action that occurred because of circumstances. And so we do have to recognize how we talk about this is as much important as having the conversation itself. And so the words we use are always, always important um, because we don't want to offend uh, because there are survivors of those who have died by suicide, loved ones, family, friends, church members, community members, and it affects all of us. Um, we talked about <laughs> middle-aged white men. Here I am, and I'm, I have attempted the act twice in the past 10 years. And so since, you know, what was it, 2013? Now it's 2023. Uh, absolutely. It's easy to push that conversation aside and say, it's really uncomfortable. I don't want to have it. When you've tried and you know people, and then you know, no of people because I'm having conversations. Uh, it's more, even though the data is strong, it's more frequent than we want to think about. Um, it's easy to, uh, and you and I are both running podcasts. So even if it's not something that we directly approach in terms of our questions and the conversation, you might want to, you know, do you have this is ever has this ever happened? Or do you know of anybody? And I think more and more you're going to get the nod, yes, even if they don't want to talk about it directly. But my involvement here and what got what gets me here is the evolution of my podcast conversations. And so since COVID and the quarantine, I've had I'm having more and more conversations because I developed a podcast called The Question Guy as a result of just needing to have conversations with people. So yeah. from COVID, you know, being isolated from everybody, it's hard, it's difficult. And so on my LinkedIn connection list, I just started tapping on people's virtual door and say, hey, do you wanna have a conversation? And more and more people were saying yes. And so, mm. 
And they were sharing such incredible stories of personal transformations because we were faced with yuck. We were faced with ourselves looking in the mirror and saying, I don't like who this person is. I don't like who I see. And they were making intentional transformations to be better, to be healthy, to become more aligned with who they wanted to be, not with what they had become because of expectations, either of themselves or their family or society or whatever. And so these conversations became more intense and more intentional about what people were doing to make changes in their life. And then from that evolved Coach's Corner. And so from those changes, people be, people um, designed business models from their own personal transformation and became coaches and book uh, you know, authors and, and writers and speakers. Mm-hmm. And people were, were making those changes and helping other people make those changes. And then from all of that, the foundational conversation was always about how somebody felt and thought about themselves because without that internal alignment there wasn't any change happening and so Mm. from all that i designed what i call the envision speaker series which is now uh, the big podcast so the other two sit on my youtube channel but the envision speaker series is going to publish to simplecast and get on you know all your major podcast platforms Mm -hmm. and this these conversations are designed as panel member discussions to go deeper into the conversation. It was, what does it mean to be healthy? And the very first conversation back in July of 2023 was about men's mental health and suicide prevention. And so I had brought in four people who had already been on the question guy podcast to go deeper into what does it mean? uh, And why is this conversation important? It's so important you bring that up and you even the, the terminology in vision uh, in, in leadership vision is one of the most uh, common um, characteristics of of leadership across across all all leadership approaches. So and vision because vision is essential to direction. And, and I wonder um, as you're sharing your, your a little bit of your backstory and I really appreciate that. Uh, if you don't mind sharing, you know, what was your vision of the future when you were going through those dark times and you were at the point where I'm ready to check out of this, this existence? There is no vision of the future because every day is, damn, I got to do this again. I mean, seriously, the hole becomes so deep that all you see is the darkness. Um, And so it doesn't really matter what gets you there. It's when you don't have the tools, whether the emotional or the psychological or the social tools to dig your way out, find a way out, think your way out. It becomes burdensome. Uh, The the adage is, it's not that I want to die, it's that I don't want to live because living is, 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 is a burden. Um, Sometimes, to the essential elements of breathing or thinking, uh, anxiety goes through the roof. So you're dealing with either too much sleep or not enough sleep and day after day. So there really is no vision of the future. And to be quite honest, somebody really has to step in. Uh, You can be alive enough, but you've got to tap on somebody's door and say, somebody that you trust, uh, somebody who you can disclose, can I say the word, the deep you're in, um, at least to somebody. And for me, there was at least somebody. Now, the first time there wasn't, so it was a very traumatic month uh, way back in the day. Uh, but I've, I found a way. Sometimes it's just about breathing. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, you got to yeah. learn wow. to take a deep breath. and. Hope for the best for that day. It was a long journey. The second time around, uh, I did have somebody who I could, and he'd tell me pretty much the same thing. Let's breathe (laughs) and just show up. And so those are kind of the models or the mottos. First, learn to breathe. 
and then show up for the day. Even if, and we've come to the conclusion that as long as you can get out of bed, that's a good start to the day. Mm. It's important to get out of bed. Yeah, <clears throat> there's a, I mean, there's there, there's such such a deep a, a deep sense of uh, of of sorrow that I even experience just hearing that, and I can't imagine the emotion uh, that you would have that you would have been going through. And you can't. And so when we have these conversations, it's always good to um, respect somebody's space because that's what I also try to teach and others in, in my circle, my community, uh, the community around suicide prevention and suicide awareness is if you don't know what to say, it's better really not to say anything because typically when you don't know when to say, and you just flippantly say, you know, well, things are get better or there's always tomorrow or that's not what somebody neither needs to hear nor wants to hear. They want, they need to be validated. Their emotions need to be validated. Their space needs to be validated. And if you don't know how to do that, don't do anything. But if you do know how to do it, and there are actually books now out there who actually took what verbiage to use, you know, how to be present in that situation, what to say, what not to say, how to support somebody in their, in their grief or their trauma. It's actually, I don't want to go clinical here, but there are this commonplace things to say, even if I, I, I can't, I've never been there, but I can imagine that you are going through hell right now. And if you can be in that space and tell that to somebody and have them feel appreciated, they will appreciate you all the more. Yeah. Someone listening is uh, either experiencing this or has been uh, through a, 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 an experience with a loved loved one, someone in, in around them, we've uh, the 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 challenge of mental health and suicide. Uh, it, it touches it touches everyone at some level. Someone whether it, it may be it may, it may not be someone directly related to you. It could be something that you saw or heard or you 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 are experiencing through another medium. Uh, I've I've seen it all and through my family. I've had lots of. Um, folks in my family who have experienced depression and, and, and thoughts and even acts of suicide. And the, the, the fixer tries to come out and there's not, you can't fix this. You, you can't, uh, you can't just step in, like you said, and say, you know, give the, the, in some ways, even trite expression and say, it's going to be okay. And you don't know, it may not be okay. And, and I, it's, it's such a difficult, it's a difficult place also for the person who cares. And, and I'm, I'm so thankful that you, that you provided some, some ideas of resources uh, as far as you know, books. And of course there's groups and different ways to, to, to get involved. I found even in my own family with, with, in the younger generation too, Dr. Keith, uh, lots of struggles there as well and i found as you said one of the one of the ways i've learned to to walk in in uh, companionship is to not uh, not to, to not judge uh to not try to uh, provide some kind of anecdotal medication uh, but just to be a support through this difficult time um what about words of encouragement? Have you, did, were, were they, were they uh, uh, in your camp? Were they effective at all during your, your journeys? For me personally, going through those situations where everything seems dark and I'm lost. Um, and I want to say maybe even to the larger scope that people who experience that kind of trauma and that, that type of deep, darkness words of encouragement may or may not be effective it's one the person needs to know that there's somebody else out there when that person needs to be able to talk just vent cry scream whatever 
when somebody who is faced with darkness recognizes that there is at least somebody out there who understands, even to a minimal degree, respects their space, which is darkness right now, and is going to be there when the person says, I need help. That's the starting point. Because any type of words that you're trying to put on to the situation are going to be lost. Not that they're not well intended, but they're just going to be lost. That person, until they feel that they can trust themselves again, breathe without feeling anxious again, and then think without being overwhelmed again. Even though time doesn't heal the wound, the practice of breathing and thinking and writing are what helps me at the very least and others kind of develop, redesign or redevelop a sense of normal, a sense of normalcy in the day-to-day. -day. Because at that point, it is a day-to-day. -day. It's not like, oh, I'm thinking a week down the road. No, you're not. <laughs> you're barely thinking an hour ahead of time. So. You got to breathe. And I'm doing it now. So you got to breathe. I mean, Me too. These deep, yeah. <laughs> these are deep intentional. This is designed to bring oxygen back into the body. And without doing that appropriately and intentionally, you know, the, it's easy to become anxious, overwhelmed, and the shallow breathing doesn't help. So it's practice. And then you have to practice writing things down, even if it's just scribble or pictures or whatever. Uh, trauma forces the brain into do some really weird things. And so you've got to release those energies, release those energies in a positive way. So it's easy to, to pace the floor or cry or do all those things that are not going to get you anywhere. Start it into the, to the reading. Then out loud, you've got to start speaking words, speak what you have written read a book, get your mind re-engaged in the things that you need to do slowly but surely. What I was going to say is learn to do this as a person before things go completely dark. So that's what we, you know, me and my community are hopefully helping people understand that by engaging in intentionality, I call it intentionality, other people call it meditation or whatever word you want to use, it's okay. But engaging in three or some primary, very basic daily routines to keep you focused, keep your brain engaged, keep your body healthy, makes for a much better journey for somebody who they know is easily you know, can easily turn into, you know, a, a simple situation into a traumatic situation or whatever that is. And so the journey can be long, but it can be, can be successful. Yeah. Do you, this brings me to a question regarding how much people really can um, observe someone's mental health. Even with you, was there a a period where uh, nobody would have known on the outside what you were struggling with, your, your, how you felt. Well, it depends. Um, when things get really bad, absolutely. Because uh, the second go around, um, sleeping is difficult. So if you're showing up for work and you're, you, people, the body will literally, literally look exhausted. You know, if you're sleep deprived, it will look exhausted. Um, obvious signs for some people not eating. So if you're dropping weight over a course, cause you're literally not eating, uh, these are obvious signs that something is at least different. Um, you could then go ahead and, you know, you know, I've noticed that or things look different. You want to talk. So there aren't those, you know, what we used to call those, you know, typical, movie signs that we're giving stuff away, we're saying our last goodbyes, we're writing our wills. Although that may be part of it, really we do try to hide it. But the obvious signs, 
you know, physical changes in the body. Doing things over, double checking, triple checking, pacing, walking fast, things that are different, things that are not normal for the person are obvious signs that something has changed. Yeah. So those would be the things that you would look for. And and hiding it, I mean, is there a a do is there a position of of shamefulness or different feelings? What's going on? To hide a lot of times it's because, well, I don't want to overgeneralize. For me, it was because I didn't want people to know what my circumstances were. We, especially men, men go into, into life. And as the older we get, you know, there's more pride associated with who we are. The second time around, I was unemployed for 12 months. That not only is devastating financially, it's also devastating because each sequential month, you're reinforcing the fact that nobody's finding you valuable enough to employ you, to bring you into their team. So you feel isolated, you feel ostracized. Now, it may be things that, you know, you can't write a good resume. Maybe I wasn't writing the resume that I needed to write. But you, you don't see it that way because, you know, our resume is our professional status. And when somebody doesn't even, you know, give you the email back or that call back and say, hey, I would like to interview you for a job. It becomes personal. It becomes, I'm not good enough. I have no value to the world. And so 12 months of that, <laughs> imagine what 12 months of that is, you know, that really eats away at, at you. And so, yeah, situations are, are terrible. You hit it, man. You know, value, purpose, meaning, uh, the fabric of of why we exist. Yeah, yeah. Who we are, our identity. Um, you talked about uh, the financial uh, burdens. Uh, I read an article not too long ago from Boston University that uh, that suggested uh, suicide ideation. Um, the, 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 as you, the contemplation, if you will, uh, of, of suicide rose dramatically during the pandemic. A lot of people couldn't pay the rent, their finances, uh, they were isolated. I mean, these are, uh, you think, wow, boy, I can't pay my rent. My finances are bad. Um, and of course there's lots of other issues, but these are, these are compounding challenges. It's not just because I can't pay my rent, right? There's mm -hmm. deeper issues there, as you had mentioned. As well. If you can't pay your rent, maybe your loved one then says, you know, I, I'm, I'm out of here. This isn't working. So there's another loss. Um, l lack of ego. You're on the street. I don't want to be on the street. I deserve better than this. What does life become? Things compound. Things are cumulative. Yeah. It's not, these are not just isolated factors. Our emotions are cumulative. They compound. And so yeah. it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. I've, I've, I've thought of hope as a factor in how we perceive the future and how we perceive our role in the future. And I've identified at least two kinds of hope. I know there's more, but I've identified at least two um, divergent uh, types of hope, very um, polarized, if you will. There's hopelessness, which is the, the absence of hope which sees things only as they are. And oftentimes, as you described earlier, they can be bleak, they can be lonely, they can be dark, cold, and isolated. And you have another kind of hope altogether, hopefulness, which is the fullness of hope, which sees things as surely as they can be, bright, potential, full of meaning, full of purpose, full of value, full of validation. And you'd said something early in our conversation when I asked you about your vision of the future. You said there was no future. How could you have hope for something that doesn't exist? Is that rhetorical? 
<laughs> right. <laughs> because when you're in the hole, you don't see the brightness outside. Now everybody else may, but everybody experiences that situation differently. And for me, it was can't sleep, can't eat. I'm breathing. I want things to be different. Things aren't changing. I can't change them. I would like to create a community where people can be there to offer hope, meaning that let's go grab a coffee. Let's talk about the situation. Let's take the next step. And I'll give you for an example, and then this isn't going to go real deep here, but uh, I'm a Marine. Well, I can't call myself X. I'm a combat veteran. Um, Thank you for United your States service. Marine Corps. Thank you. Um, now, that was a long, long time ago. Uh, my last tour of college professorship was training uh, military personnel, transitioning out to become IT professionals. I befriended, you know, many of the people that I taught. And recently this year, um, another uh, veteran, undergraduate degree, done master's degree in computer, you know, cybersecurity, done, certifications, done. Can you find a job? No. So I had to, I had to beg the question, are you thinking about it? He says, it's plan C. See, it's there. You know, you can't get away from, it. you know, gentlemen as old as I am, maybe a little bit younger, and I'm 54. When it all comes down to it and you can't do, you know, social status, done, you know, can't date any, ain't, ain't no girl going to date you if you ain't got the money. Uh, living in your, you know, your parents' basement or your friend's basement, whatever that looks like. So what do I do? I pull to my network and say, I got the situation. I got somebody in need. And so I connect him with a couple of people, some uh, people who I know have connections either in workforce development or are headhunters, you know, recruiters themselves. And so I've built that network. Now, other people have that network. Uh, some people join networks of whatever. Uh, I wanted to be part of that to say, hey, if there's somebody in need, let's give you the need that you need. Let's give you the resources that you need. Let's make that happen. Uh, long story short, he did find a job. <laughs> and maybe got that date. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe got that date. Well, let's get the job done first. But you see, yeah, that's where it is. Because now that I've had the experience, know deeply, personally know that there is no light at the end of that tunnel. Unless somebody's out there holding your hand, walking you with a flashlight through whatever tunnel that is. That's what you need. That's what we need. We need to be a better community of people, not to isolate one another, but to help one another, to, as you said, give and provide and maybe even be that source of hope. Yeah, man. Wow. That's, that's so heavy. That's so heavy. And it's so good. <laughs> It's so good. But I know it's, it's what we need. It's what we need. Yes. It's the right kind of heavy. It just, it, it, yeah. I'm I'm having a conversation with someone in my mind right now and someone who's struggling and in that dark place. And you just gave me a revelation in terms of how to simply have a conversation. It's look, I don't have an answer. It's dark, but I got a flashlight. Yeah. Yeah. We could find out with the way out together. Yeah. You want to, you want to, let's turn this thing on. The issue is that person needs to know that you're there every step of the way. And that's what they're looking for. Even, the, even if they're not going to tell you, that's what they need. They need somebody there, maybe more than one person, but at least one person. Because when you're in it yourself, you're in it by yourself. And yeah. that's what's scary. That's what the most, that's the scariest thing in the world. By yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Because we are, we as human beings, we are communal creatures. We are communal species. We are designed for one another. Yes. Yes. And this pandemic, 
uh, was a true test of that. Boy, the isolation was just, ah, it was horrific. Uh, even f- people who were dying, not necessarily from suicide, but dying from disease and whatnot, were not even able to be with their loved ones and they had to die alone. It was just so tragic. Yeah. I've got stories. People, their parents were like in nursing homes and the only way they were allowed to talk to each other was through the, like the window of the room. It's like, yeah, it was a really weird situation for all of us. Yeah. So, uh, the, 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 the conversation we're having is an important conversation because it's, it's helping to, identify some of the challenges that people face as they're moving through this this experience in their own lives and for those of us who perhaps have not experienced that level of darkness to peer into the spirit to the mind to the to the life of someone who's struggling in that area i know for myself uh and i've just uh i i I, i've I've wanted to uh, always be um, a ray of sunshine for for anyone who's who's in a tough spot uh, who I know in my in my camp. And sometimes I just I, I, I don't know how, but you give me you give me comfort to know that Nate, you don't have to have all the answers. In fact, you're not going to have any of them. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Unless you read a couple of books that I could have referred you to. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. And, but as a, as a, you know, a, a neophyte, a novice, someone who is a, a lay person from the mental health space who just wants to be a friend, a companion to hold a hand in the darkness with a flashlight and say, let's find our way out together. Uh, that's reassuring to me uh, because I don't have to come up with some amazing plan. Uh, that you say probably isn't going to matter anyway, because the plan really only needs to be for some at some point. Breathe. Yeah, let's breathe. Yeah. Just and when you get good at it, it, it feels good. It does. You get oxygen to the brain and to yes. the body. Now, what do you say? What do you say to someone who is uh, who's who's like me who? Uh, wants to to help someone who's in a situation to where it, perhaps it's more dire. Uh, perhaps it's not, hey, let's find a way to get out of bed. Perhaps like at midnight, they want to, uh, they're not, they're just, they, they have no other hope, no other answer, no way out. If it's in a dire situation and they're literally telling you that guns in my hand, or, you know, they're calling from a cell phone and they're on the top of a bridge. Uh, tell them, I get it. You know, you're ready to make that decision. What's, you can ask them because they're, they're not afraid anymore. I mean, there, there's no more fear there. You know, life is just, and there's no more fear. What, what, what's going to take? What's going to push you over that edge? You just call me to say goodbye? No. There are people in, my, in this community. I'm going to say my community, but it's this community to say, Dr. Keith, you're crazy at this point. You can challenge them. What's going to what's going to be the next step? You know, is it simply that you've called me to say goodbye and you're leaving, you know, to, to deal with that? Or, you know, can we, can I come out there, you know, or what's going to take you to breathe? today, the next 10 minutes. Now, if they're on somewhere, you know, if they're on drugs or whatever, and, you know, there's lots of different variables here, you know, if you can get a location, you know, you are, if you're with somebody, your spouse, friend, whatever, um, you know, and they're calling 911 and they, you, as a, just a human being, I mean, you may not have any professional responsibility as a, as a first responder or anything like that. But if you can, you know, make the attempt to get 911 first responders to the situation, that would be appropriate. For you on the call, what can we do to help you breathe? What can I do today? What do you need from me? What do you need from me? And if that person just starts to cry, let them cry. 
if that person just turns to screen, let them screen. But find out what they need. I just need a reason to live. I need a job. I need somebody to hold my hand. I need somebody to, I'm going to start crying here in a second. I'm not going to do that because it's, it could be anything. And, you know, when I, you know, I told you, I think either on the pre-call or at the beginning of this conversation, that I was a mental health professional. And I actually served as a crisis responder uh, for a 24-hour hotline, you know, back in the day because I was a social worker. And sometimes it can be that dire, you know, gun in my hand, you know. And sometimes it could be a challenge. You know, okay, gun's in your hand. What are you going to do? If they kill themselves, the person on the other end of the phone, i.e. you or me, don't take it personal because it wasn't meant to be. They just couldn't deal with it anymore. You will need to receive some counseling because that's the hard thing to deal with because you just heard somebody kill themselves if they did. But at the same time, if you can give them just something that they need, I can listen to you. I can definitely do that. Talk to me. That's what you need to do. Now, I didn't want to take this, <laughs> our, our time together on this podcast to take you down a deep hole. There is actually a lot of good things going on, especially in my world, because I've started the Envision Speaker Series, and that's designed to get people comfortable in the conversation around what it means to be healthy mm -hmm. and keep it and keep people in that space and so far it's in an it's in its infancy and i'm getting good feedback from the conversations that i'm having so the goal is to make the conversation normal yeah that we're not putting people in isolation and in fear and anxiety. So your your podcast is about leadership. And so my step into the leadership of the space is to design conversations around what it means to be healthy. And if I can plug it, I'm having a special yeah, event absolutely. in January where I'm not only designing the conversations around mental health to change you know, what it means to be healthy and to change the conversation, I'm asking professionals that I know to take a look at certain problems, issues that we're currently faced with globally, and let's start proposing solutions because the evolution of the Envision Speaker Series is not, the start of it is to change the conversation. The second one is to address the problems, and then the third one, as we fully evolve, is to make systematic, sustainable change in that space. If our, if our politicians can't do it, we need to do it Yes, at the grassroots level. We need to be responsible for each other. Now, it sounds like I'm singing from my soapbox and I kind of am because I'm really kind of fed up, <laughs> to be quite honest. Those numbers that you quoted earlier, they're all wrong. Not that they're not correct in terms of your data, we shouldn't be having those numbers is what I'm saying. That's right. We should you want to eradicate it. A, I want to eradicate it, but we need to do something. And so I'm doing right. something about it. Sorry. I love that you're doing I got something excited. About it. And we will make sure that those links are in our show notes so people know how to find you and your events and your worthy mission. I appreciate that. Man, Dr. Keith, uh, we'll have to have a follow-up because uh, this is just too important and you're too important and your work's too important not to share it. I believe uh, in the hopefulness that you are spreading and uh, you have our support as you continue on this worthy mission. Thank you, sir. Dr. Nate, it's been a pleasure to be here. It's good having you.